Hi everybody, welcome to my Sky Diary for March 2021. So let's have a look forward to see what we can see up in the night sky and the daytime sky throughout the rest of March. Okay, don't forget if you find my Sky Diary useful or any of my videos, come to that, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like my videos as well and send me some comments as well if you like, so that'd be great. Okie dokie, don't forget we run the Virtual Astronomy Club. Um, at the moment, it's the first and the third Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Universal Time. And if you want details of how to join in the Astronomy Fun, go to virtual-astro-club.com and you get all the information and all our speakers that come in and give us talks on the website. So come in and join us. So we're going to talk about the sky. This is the view of my almost all sky cam that I've managed to get installed in my garden. So you can see I've got quite a big area of sky visible from my back garden, which is absolutely fantastic. This tree is a bit of a pain, but hey, you can't have everything. OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, what stars are visible throughout the month. So this is looking towards the north. This is about 10 o'clock in the evening, mid month. And you can see you've got Ursa Major, which is virtually overhead around this time of the year, at that time of night. And, of course, below it, you've got the Little Bear, Ursa Major. And winding between them, you've got the meandering body of Draco going down to the asterism of the lozenge at the head of the dragon. You've got Cassiopeia, the five W or M-shaped star pattern over here in the opposite direction from Ursa Major from Polaris in the opposite direction there. And you've got Cephas, which is getting really low at the moment, at that time of night. OK, so this is the uh, stars looking south. So if you look south at 10 o'clock in the evening, mid-month, this is roughly the view that you're going to see. So Gemini over here and Orion, they're starting to set over there, and we'll come to those in a little while. Canis Major and the bright star Sirius, the brightest star in the whole sky, of course. Taurus, the bull over here. We've got Monoceros, the unicorn. Cancer, the crab. Leo, the lion. And, of course, we're getting into the realm of the galaxies now, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then the indistinct meandering constellation of Hydra, just coming down from Cancer down here into the southern hemisphere. And then you've got Crater and if we look over towards the west, these are the constellations that are starting to set. Again, mid-month, 10 o'clock at night. So these are the constellations that are getting lower and lower in our sky. You've got Andromeda just disappearing over here in the Andromeda galaxy. You can just see there. You've got Orion, which is now getting lower and lower. Aries, Mars is still here. Mars is going to be visible for a while. So although this part of the sky is disappearing, Mars is going to be visible for a while because it's moving in this direction. Perseus, Taurus, of course, Auriga, the charioteer, and Gemini, the twins, which we discussed a little while ago. And of course, most people forget Canis Minor, the little dog here with its brightest star, Poseidon, there as well. And if we look towards the east, these are the constellations that are coming up. Ursa Major is getting really, really high in the sky at the moment. So that's going to be good for looking in there for an object I'm going to point out right at the very end. Of course, we've got Draco, I mentioned before, meandering between the two bears here. We've got Hercules just coming up with a wonderful star cluster, Messier 13, the globular star cluster. We've got Bertie's, the herdsman, with the bright star Arcturus over here. Leo, we mentioned before, the sickle of Leo here, the backwards question mark on the body of Leo. Coma Berenices, where there's so many galaxies, it's crazy, in between Leo. And, of course, Virgo as well, where there's just a whole realm of galaxies to be explored during the spring sky. But lights are getting, nights are getting lighter, so you need to watch. Um, don't leave it too long because you're going to run out of night sky. By the time we get to April and May, you're going to really run out of dark skies to be able to catch these really nicely. OK, the moon, that's always the thing that interferes with your observing. So there you can see the phases of the moon. So we've got last quarter moon, which is on the 6th 
of the month. And so the very beginning of the month is going to be a very bright moon. Uh, so that's going to hinder some of your deep sky stuff. And then you've got the second and third week, reasonable dark skies. And then, of course, the last couple of weeks of the month, it's going to be quite a bright moon again. So new moon is on the 13th. 21st is back to first quarter. And then the full moon is on the 28th of March. So let's have a look at where the planets are this month. Mercury, very low down in the morning sky. It's actually quite a long way from uh, the sun, but because of the angle of the ecliptic, which I'll talk about in a little while, it's going to stay really close to the horizon, so it's not going to rise until the sky is really bright. So western elongation is actually on the 6th of March. So you can see it's uh, away from the sun, but because of that angle of the ecliptic in the morning sky, in the eastern morning sky, it's not going to be very far above the horizon before the sun rises superior conjunction when it's on the far side of the sun is going to be on april the 19th but it's not really going to be seen until april when it moves into the evening sky and then we may have a chance to see it then and then eastern elongation when it's visible in the western sky in the evening is on may the 17th so we've got a chance in the next couple of months april and may to be able to see mercury reasonably well Venus, that's going to stay close, too close to the sun to be seen. It is in the morning sky, but it's really in the uh, sun's glare, so we're not going to see that at all throughout this month. Superior conjunction is on the 26th of March, so right towards the end of the month. And then it will be late May before it appears in the evening western sky, so you'll be able to see it late May. So it's going to take quite a while to go around the back end of the sun and start to be seen in the evening western sky just after sunset and that's going to be late may and eastern elongation is going to be october the 29th so it's going to take a long time to move away from the sun and reach its greatest elongation right the way at the end of october mars that's still visible in the evening sky of course it's nowhere near like it was september october november last year it's really really small it's still very very bright but it is a small disc jupiter and saturn both very low down in the morning eastern sky they're moving into the uh, morning sky but again because of the angle of the ecliptic they do stay very very low down so they are quite difficult to find before the sun rises uranus that's visible in the aries magnitude plus 5.8 so it is just visible with the naked eye as a faint star but of course you do need fairly dark skies to be able to see it uh, binoculars bring it out well telescope will show it and if you need a really big reasonably big telescope to actually show the disc and perhaps pick out some of the moons as well Neptune that's slipping into the evening twilight so we've effectively lost that one as well now so uh, we're gonna have to wait for that to appear in a few months time back in the morning sky okay early March Mars passes between the Pleiades and the Hyades so this is the view of Mars on the 1st of March so here it is almost directly south of the Pleiades so there it is and then on the 8th of March, you can see it's moved and it's virtually between the Pleiades and the Hyades star cluster. So it's the 8th of March that's going to be almost slap bang in between the two clusters. So that's going to look really, really nicely. And it'd be nice to compare the colour of Mars being so red with Aldebaran, the red eye of the bull here, the brightest star in Taurus sitting in the Hyades as well. So that could be quite nice to compare the colours. And then by the 15th of March, you can see Mars has moved a little bit further over. So it's moved from here, right the way across here, mid-month. And I'll show you the path of Mars as we go. So here it is. So uh, here's where it was on the 1st of January, up in Pisces. 21st of January, it passed Uranus. 1st of February is below Aries, the Ram. And then the 1st of March, here it is near the Pleiades here. And then the 1st of April, it's nestled in the horns of Taurus the bull. So here's the Hyades and Aldebaran. So here's Messier 1, the Crab Nebula, 
in the horns of the bull and here's where mars is going to be on the first of april by the 27th of may it's moved really close to messier 35 the lovely open star cluster in the foot of gemini but don't get too excited because by that time it will have dwindled down into the evening twilight um, and the sun is going to be there so it's going to be really low down in the western sky just before uh, just after sunset and so it's going to be quite difficult to see the cluster next to mars but give it a go you never know low in the west and then by june it's mars is almost in line with castor and pollux in gemini here but again that's going to be lost in the uh, twilight i would have thought and it finally reaches solar conjunction in the 8th of October. So it's going to take a while for the sun to catch Mars up because Mars moves quite swiftly against the background sky. But by the 8th of October, the sun would have caught it up and it would disappear and reach solar conjunction on the 8th of October. And then the next opposition isn't going to be until the 8th of December 2022. It's going to be in Taurus, so it's going to be really high up in the sky. So it should give us a nice view. The only thing is because it is so far north of the ecliptic it does mean it's a bit further away a lot further away than it was last year and so it's not going to be quite as big as it was last year but because it's so high we should get hopefully some steadier skies to be able to see it fairly clearly so let's see what happens okay the other astronomical or solar system object that's uh, at opposition this month is Vesta one of the asteroids and here's the path of it in Leo so here's Regulus this is the sickle of Leo here and you see the body of Leo here a friend of mine once said to me Leo is a mouse and here you see the nose of the mouse and here you can see the tail and ever since he said that that's all I can see I don't see a lion anymore I see a mouse but there you go um, the magnitude of Vesta is plus 6.3 so it's not quite naked eye visibility but you should be able to pick it out in binoculars or a small telescope so it's fairly bright uh regulus and leo sickle of leo so here's where the uh, asteroid was on the first of february so it's, it's moved up into the tail of leo or the nose of the mouse and here it is at opposition on the 5th of march so it's fairly close to this star here shirtan and then by the end of march it's starting to move around it starts to progress around into a bit of a loop as the earth overtakes it and by the 28th of april it started to move down in that direction so now is the best time to get out there and have a look for vesta it's fairly not fairly bright and should be easy in binoculars or small telescope so see if you can hunt that small speck of light down and take a picture or do a drawing of its position from night to night and you'll see how much it moves okay 5th of march the moon it passes north of antares the bright star in scorpius so here's the view at just before five o'clock in the morning on the 14th of march the moon comes out of the uh, twilight and we get a ridiculously thin crescent moon visible here it is it's really really uh, thin uh so see if you can catch that 14th of march around about six o'clock 6 30 and you should be able to see if you've got a really low western horizon be able to see that really really thin crescent moon the next night on the 15th it's a little bit further out but uh it's still fairly thin but not as thin as it was the night before but uh so you've got a couple of opportunities to see in a really nice thin crescent moon. Again, about 6.30 on the 15th of March, you should be able to see that. And then on the 16th of March, the moon's got a bit further out. It's in a bit more of a darker sky, so it sets a bit later. So we should be able to see some really nice earth shine shining on that wonderful crescent moon over in the evening sky at about 6.30 on the 16th of March. But get out there a couple of days before and see if you can see that extremely thin crescent moon and of course the reason we can see those is because there's quite a steep angle to the horizon the ecliptic is showing a very steep angle and so the moon 
is quite high up away from the sun and above the horizon after the sun sets and that's in the evening sky in the spring if you go and look in the autumn the angle is much shallower so the moon has to be a lot further out to be further above the horizon and so that's why spring gives you the best option to see the moon after sunset and catch it really really thin so autumn isn't so good for that and it's the opposite way round in the morning sky so in the morning sky at the moment the angle is really really narrow in the opposite direction as shown here and so the planets and the moon are really difficult to see as they get closer to the sun okay so and that angle gives us another opportunity to see something else as well so here's the 15th of march so here's the 15th of september you see how much much the angle has changed between those two if you're a little bit further south say at miami if only uh, you can see the angle is much higher in the sky so they see the moon much um, better than we do just after it comes out from the sun and if you're in sydney you can see that the angles are in totally the opposite direction and so they don't see the moon as well in the spring but they see it better in the autumn which is the opposite way around to what we see and of course this angle of the ecliptic also gives us an opportunity at this time of the year in the evening sky to see something else of course it's the zodiacal light and it's this time of the year, you can see it in the evening western sky after sunset, but of course, in the autumn sky, it's best seen before sunrise in the morning. Okay, and this is it here. This is the Pleiades. This is Taurus, the Hyades here. These are the rocks de Garcia up at Tenerife, and this cone of light is the zodiacal light and that's the only time i've ever seen the zodiacal light because you do need extremely dark skies to be able to see it it is visible from the uk but you have to get away from all the street lights to make sure you can see this faint glow again avoid the moon make sure you go out when the moon's not about which can flood that really faint light and it's caused by dust in the solar system and it's the sunlight reflecting off the dust in the solar system causing this light so get out there and have a look and see if you can see the zodiacal light or perhaps take a picture of it so it's close to the plane of the ecliptic and it's illuminated by the sun Okay, 18th and 19th of March in the western sky, the moon is going to be close to Pleiades and Mars and Taurus. So here's the Pleiades, here's the Hyades and Aldebaran. Here's Mars as well. And of course, here's a lovely thick crescent moon. The next night, the moon is just below Mars. So you can see that's moved quite nicely across from there. 20th of March, of course, it's the spring equinox. Day and night are equal. Uh, and of course, after that, if you're an astronomer, bad news because the nights are getting lighter. We're losing our darkness. So by the time we get to April, May and June, we're not really going to have any real dark sky. So make the most of any clear times you get now and make sure you get up in the early morning sky to make the most of those spring skies and those galaxies because once you get into April, May, it's going to be a nightmare trying to image them because the sky is not going to be quite as dark and you have to stay up really late to uh, get a dark sky and it doesn't really get dark once you get into June anyway. Okay, day and night equal. Evening's getting a lot lighter and then the same date, 20th of March, the lunar X and V are going to be visible. Here's the moon. It's moved on a little bit from where it was with Mars. And of course, the lunar X and lunar V are what we call a clair obscure effect, where the sunlight hits certain features and we see things in them. It starts at 2200 hours universal time. And I've taken all these times for the lunar X from Mary McIntyre's astronomy blog, which I put at the bottom down here for you, um, which is well worth visiting her blog. And it's the borders of these three craters Blankenus, Lecao and the Purbach craters here that give you this lunar X and you can see the X showing up really really nicely but the effect only lasts for about two hours as the sun 
is rising over these three craters and then it's soon gone. So there they are, Purbeck, Lycaea and Blancius craters making up that lunar X. And the lunar V is in the southern part of Mare Vaporum, close to Rima Hyginus. So here it is here. So this is Rima Hyginus, Trisnecca, Agrippa, Godin and Ryticus craters and Manilus, and this is the lunar V. So it picks up really, really nicely at that uh, lunation. Okay, 23rd of March in the southern sky, the moon's going to be in line with Castor and Pollux. So this is Castor and Pollux, and here's the moon, and of course, this is Cancer with uh, Messier 44 in there as well. 25th and the 26th of March in the southern evening sky, the moon passes north of Regulus in Leo. So here's Regulus. This is the uh, sickle of Leo here. And then 29th and the 30th of March in the western sky, the moon passes north of Spica in Virgo. It's a little, you've got to get up a little bit later um, for this as well in the early morning sky. But here's Spica here. And then I mentioned the plow and Ursa Major being fairly high up in the sky as we go into the next few months. Of course, Comet Leonard is in that constellation at the moment. So this is the path of Comet Leonard throughout the year. And this shows 10 day intervals. So you can see how much it moves in 10 days between each of these little red marks along the path. So there's Bertie's, the herdsman, Canis Venatici, of course, Ursa Major, and you've got Dubé and Merak, the two pointer stars. And of course, you've got Alcor and Mizar here as well. So here's where the comet was on the 1st of January, 1st of February, and here's where it is on the 1st of March. So it's not actually, let's go back a bit. So it's not actually that far away from M101, which is just over here. But it's a really faint comet, gradually brightening and could be quite exciting towards the end of the year. I have put a different video together to show you what we might or might not expect of this comet. So 1st of March, that's where it's going to be, not far from M101. 1st of April, it's brightening all the time. So gradually, gradually. So it passes north of Alcor and Mizar around about the 12th of March. So uh, good pointer to see if you can get your scope in the right direction. I'm going to be trying as early as possible to get that once the moon's out of the way and see if I can pick the comet up and follow it as it comes in and hopefully getting bigger and brighter. So 1st of April, it's just approaching the bowl of the plough. 1st of May, it's just going to go into the bowl of the plough and it's just going to go through and skirt the corner there. 1st of June, it's just off the end of the two pointers, Dubai and Merak. And then 1st of July, 1st of August, 1st of September. Now this is where it's going to start getting exciting because it's getting close to the sun, it's getting close to the earth and it should brighten. <clears throat> but this is gonna be, by this time, the plow is gonna get, be getting lower in the northwestern sky. So that's gonna hinder the observations a little bit up to that point. And then end of November, hopefully we should get some exciting things happening. But I've talked about that in my other video. So have a look at my Comet Leonard video that I've put on YouTube as well. OK, that's it for the month. So Virtual Astronomy Club, just to remind you, it meets on the first and the third Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Universal Time. And go to the web page virtual-astro-club.com and you get all the details on how to join in the astronomy fun. The Sky Diary, all the dates that I've got on here and the maps I've shown you are available on my Sky Diary, star-gazing.co.uk forward slash diary. And here's what it looks like. There are now three calendars on there. There's the blue one, which is the Sky Diary. That tells you what you can see up in the sky at certain times and dates. There's the red one, which is space activities and events, and that's all to do with anything that's happening astronomy wise that I learn of. And I put those events in that calendar and all the details of how to join in with that event as well. And then the black one is space date. So that's all about 
any anniversaries of any uh, space flight or astronomy uh, that we uh, know of and I'm gradually filling in all those dates and you can carry this around with you you download the team up app again all the details are on the web page star gazing.co.uk forward slash diary so you can carry that diary around with you so you've always got the dates up to date and I'm continually amending it and adding things as we go okay if you find my sky diary useful don't forget subscribe to my youtube channel and also like my video okay thank you very much and i'll see you all again bye bye